Hey followers, this is your boy, Movie Maker Doug 55. Today I have another actor appearing on my channel, and he acted in this movie, Inspector Gadget 2, many years ago. And his name is Mungo McKay. Hey Mungo. Oh hi. Hi Douglas. Hey. <laughs> I loved your creepy intro. It it kind of reminded me of Dracula a little bit. <laughs> yeah, did it? Oh, I wasn't thinking of Dracula. Oh, what were you thinking of? I was thinking, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Boy, so thank you for having me. No problem. So where are you at right now? Um, I'm at home. Well, Berlin. yeah, but uh, what city? Uh, the city, uh, it's uh, Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> so Brisbane, Australia, which is on the eastern side of Australia. When you're looking at the map, hopefully around the right way, it's on the right-hand side, about halfway up. Ah, most Australians that I know pronounce it Brisbane, and some of them call it Brisbane. It, how is it pronounced? No, Brisbane. Brisbane. Or, Briz or Brizzy. Or the other one is Briz Vegas. Briz <laughs> Vegas was, yeah, Briz Vegas was a term I think that was thrown around quite a lot, maybe in the 90s, uh, the mid 90s, early 2000s. Briz Vegas. Briz Vegas. Yeah. I've never heard that. <laughs> oh, well, probably not because only people from Brisbane, I think, would say that. <laughs> Back then, that is. That was about 30 years ago now. Such a long, such a long time. Yeah. One of the things that I had a hard time pronouncing growing up in America was the state of Massachusetts. That was hard to spell as a kid when I was in spelling class. <laughs> hard to spell. Easy to say. Easy to say, but hard to spell. <laughs> Massachusetts. It's like you've got something in your mouth when you say that. Yeah. And, and, and you know that, speaking of which, you know that town up, up in Wales that's, that is spelled like Lanfair, Pugwingil, you ever heard of that? Uh, in Wales? Yeah, in Wales. There, there are some lengthy names in yeah. Wales. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen the outtakes, I think, on, on uh, YouTube with the, uh, the, uh, the English weather people trying to pronounce some of these huge long names. Yeah, and some of them sound like you're saying them when having a stroke. <laughs> Maybe it might be better to have one while you're saying it then you can pronounce it properly. Yeah, touche. Like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. I know where that is. Mm. Yeah, so. So, yeah, I must ask you, uh, Tell everybody in America what role you're known for in Disney. Uh, well, I was in Inspector Gadget 2, and I was the bartender at the Blue Monkey Bar. And I appear for it in, in one scene, and you'll recognize me because I have a smelly, pooey monkey on my shoulder in an Elvis outfit. And Gadget comes in and asks where, where, you know, where Claw is. And I get into a fight with him. Yeah, but you can't miss me. I got a smelly pooey monkey on my shoulder. It was frightening. <laughs> but it was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, those monkeys, you know, they can go wild sometimes. Well, yeah, when you're, when you're looking at me, you can just imagine me thinking, please, I don't want to have my ear bitten off. Don't bite my ear off. Don't bite my ear off. And then cut. Oh, great. Get it off my shoulder. <laughs> oh, my God. That was, it was, it was a little scary. But the funny thing is that, you know, the monkey made us late. The monkey put us behind schedule because it slept in. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, animal, the owners didn't want to wake up the monkey. So, you know, at the monkey's discretion, when it got up, then it was ready to come in and, <clears throat> well, I had to get the costume on, the Elvis costume. But it was a little bit of a little bit of trouble. Put us a little a little bit behind. Yeah. 
That's really mm -hmm. interesting. So yeah, that's what you're known for. And I remember watching that movie all the time growing up. It's, it's kind of ironic because I didn't watch the first movie that much, but the second one I watched all the time. <laughs> yeah. I used to watch the cartoon. Um, yeah, the cartoon. I, I, I like the cartoon with, uh, with Don Adams doing the voice for Gadget. I used yeah, to like watch that when I was a kid. Yeah, that's really interesting. That, I'll have to check out that show, but I did know growing up it was based on a show. Yeah, yeah, based on the, well, the cartoon, the comic. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was fun. Go, go, Gadget, you know, whatever he needed. Go, go, Gadget, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that there have been some moments where I wish I could say, go, go, Gadget, you know, and get myself out of things I didn't want to do, you know? Like what? <laughs> like... Like if I'm stuck in traffic, you know, there are times where I can imagine wanting to just say, go, go gadget, airplane wings, so I can fly out of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I was thinking of something more along, go, go gadget juicer. I'd like some orange juice. Go, go <laughs> gadget juicer. Or just go, go gadget orange tree first with oranges that pop out so then I can actually juice them. I got an orange tree and a juicer. Yeah. That would be pretty magical, wouldn't it? But it wouldn't be mechanical, though, or would it? Would it be factory-flavored? Factory-flavored orange juice. Yeah, that, that would be really cool. <laughs> I love your sense of humor. Well, well, it's kind of practical, though, isn't it? I mean, things that taste natural taste natural as compared to things that taste factory. You know, fresh from the factory. When you open that packet up and you get that smell, you know, yeah. like a chip packet. You ever opened up a chip packet and it's gone <clears throat> when you've opened it up and then you've smelt it and it's like, ooh, you know, who cut the cheese? <laughs> who cut the cheese in that? That's just really, you ever, you ever opened up chip packets and smelt the, had that fart smell come out? <laughs> had the fart smell come out? Truly, have you done that? I've, I've heard the sound, but I haven't smelled anything like that. But I, I do agree with you, you know, that natural food is better than processed. Well, what do you hold your breath for something? Do you hold your breath when you open it up? I mean, yeah, you could possibly hold your breath, wouldn't you be, in anticipation? Because you never know if you're going to rip too hard, you know, and all the chips go everywhere. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so oh. I... Finally, but then the gas escapes, whatever's in the bag, you know, that's been sitting in there for so many months, you know, <laughs> finally yeah. gets let out, you know, that, that fetid smell. It doesn't smell bad all the time, though. You know, sometimes you can get chips and it smells all right when you open the bag up. Maybe they're fresher. Maybe it's the old ones that you, want, you don't want to be careful of. So the closer to the use by date or the best before date, you know, it's like, well, we'll just, we should just wait. You know, maybe open them up over here at arm's length. Hold your breath. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> that I've experienced that. So I must ask you, man, uh, where are you originally from? Uh, I was born in Brisbane. Uh, lived in Brisbane pretty much all my life. Uh, it's a great place. It's a it's a lovely place. It's um it's not too hot and it's not too cold. Um, it does get uh cold maybe for two weeks of the year and uh, then it's fine and it might be hot for about a month maybe uh, we have air conditioning here so it's not as if you know we're sweltering but it's better just sort of some, turn it down really low or not low as in it's really cold so you don't die when you walk outside but no I've, I've lived here all my life um, I've had opportunities you know through acting to travel to different places which is always which has been good um, but I've never had a real desire to, um, to move abroad. I know to extend one's career, especially, you know, when you live in Brisbane, it's like, it's almost like in the middle of nowhere, um, in filmmaking in Australia, because, uh, the, the, the precedent is usually that Sydney is first, Melbourne is second, and then Brisbane is leftovers. So even though we have productions up here, 
Um, it's usually just a lot of the extra work that gets dished out or just some of the really small parts. But even with small parts, they'll just fly someone up because Sydney's only an hour's flight or 50 minutes from Brisbane. You can fly to Sydney, you know, so it's more convenient for them to pick and choose from where they think is the first port of call, so to speak. Um, so the whole notion of like, well, you got to get the get out of Dodge is, yeah, it's true if you want to further your, your career or extend it or, or, you know, make it bigger. But and a lot of actors that I know have done that, you know, they moved overseas and they're doing quite well for themselves and that that's good for them. But I don't know. I just felt like staying in the one spot um, is just as good as moving to another place. I mean, you, you can find the positives no matter where you go. So I don't look at sort of being in the one place all my life as being held back, so to speak. It, it doesn't really exist anyway these days, is it? Look, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you around the other side of the planet. It's amazing. You know, it's sort of like, okay, personal experience is one thing. That's good. And that comes with travel um, through that experience. But uh with working opportunities, I mean, acting for me is not the be and an end all. It's sort of I've fallen more into the aspect of of coaching people or uh, teaching um, acting because uh, that seems to be more. I think um, my I guess my background now is that uh, I've been teaching acting for twenty years. Uh -huh. So. So is that kind of why your productions or your film credits have kind of slowed down a bit over the years? Because you're more into teaching than acting? Um, yeah, but also, too, it's sort of like I did so much work when I was younger. I mean, ah. I play just a, a, a huge amount of different roles. Um, and those experiences were interesting. And, and, you know, even though a lot of this stuff isn't broadcast. It, it's, it's sort of made and then it's put in, put in the closet, so to speak. Not a lot of it gets out there. Um, and that's not the most important thing, I think. It's more of the personal experience because the, the byproduct, even if you could call it that, it's not really a byproduct, but it's sort of the, the after effect is that finished product that everyone has a chance or opportunity to see. Um, but so, cause I did so much work that eventually when I, you know, the older you get this, sort of, you do slow down a little bit, um, and you sort of pick and choose the opportunities a little bit, but you put more scrutiny into it. Um, you work with people, you, you don't work with, uh, first year film students anymore, for example, even though that's a lot of fun, but those guys are, are really sort of just beginning their learning process. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and because I did a lot of that stuff, you know, I, there, there'd be sometimes I'd be doing two or three films at a time, two or three short films at a time. So I'd be on set, um, you know, in the morning for one film and then the schedule worked out for me to be on another film in the afternoon and then I could be in one later on in the night. So I get a couple hours sleep in the car and then be on set in the morning for the, you know, for the continuation of the shooting of, the, of you know, uh, I, I was crazy. I do so, I, I did as much as I possibly could um, with the time that I had. Uh, so I worked really hard and, but I think it, what it turned out to be was that my path was more within the process of conveying my experiences to students by giving it under in the form of a structure because I was taught by a master teacher. You know, I was under the, under the wing of a master teacher um, for pretty much nearly two decades. Um, so I was taught by the best. Uh, and, and her, uh, I guess, second in charge, her student, is, he was a brilliant teacher as well. So I was trained very well within a structure of being able to um, create a character from the ground up. So uh, within my journey, that's where I seem to have pivoted to. It's not so much trying to cr create a huge career um, working as an actor. It's, it's more almost behind the scenes now, working with other actors, helping them grow through 
me conveying my understanding um, of, through experience and structure to them to, to give them a better performance, to make them just that bit better than what they, or potentially, potentially better than what they already are. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a pretty cool that you're doing that now, helping others. I'm I'm all about helping others as well. Yeah, it, it's people's paths sometimes. You know, you don't. I mean, look, the, the, you aren't the you aren't the center of the universe, um, but you play a, a particular role within the universe. That you know, the the definition of key players. You know, just are the ones that make the most noise and draw the most attention to, to themselves. You know, key players are everyone's a key player within a certain aspect in their lives. Everything fits together, so we're all driving towards, you know, an end result. Well, not an end result because it just seems to be going progressing further and further onwards. So, um, you know, the the desires that we have, especially through the way we've been. Um, <clears throat> program, so to speak, to think through what we um, consume uh, through the media. Uh, it's, it's this expectation of that we we have to succeed and be so successful in a way that um, it, it stands out. And that's not what really life is. We all have our own personal successes. Um, you know, so we need to look at our lives practically don't we you know it's something that you the, the practical sense of living is knowing what you are capable of doing you know it's it's not a matter of dreaming the oh yes i will i i will do this it's sort of the problem is the end result we we're, we're taught that within the con the construct the confines of a one and a half hour movie or two hour movie everything happens so quickly almost overnight and you will be successful when that is an illusion you know the reality of our time and space is that things progress uh at a slower rate you know some faster than others but eventually you know ultimately we're here for one another yeah share the love <laughs> love that reference so yeah, yeah that's that's really cool that's really cool. I I must ask you, uh, how did you land your role as the bartender in Inspector Gadget 2? Oh, it was a face-to-face -face audition, um, and it was only one. It was the one audition, I, and I wasn't happy with it either. I thought I really screwed it up. Um, but uh, th from from my understanding of when you do an audition, okay, you work in, a, in the parameters of the frame. It's just what you, you're in at the moment and what I'm in, the, in at the moment. So I'm in just above a mid close up. Um, and uh, with that audition, because it was a bartender, it was like, okay, the circumstances a bar. Usually, what do you do in a bar? You might dry glasses. Um, you do all these particular, mind these actions that if you're truthful and you do it under the frame, you create the illusion that you're doing it. So I think I, I did that with the dialogue as well as um, you want to try and do something a little bit different. And I thought, okay, even though we're not seeing it, um, I, I think I had a screwdriver, like an actual, not a physical real screwdriver, but I was imagining I had a screwdriver and I was trying to get some really crusty bits out of a glass Ah. Just to sort of vary it because it's something and something that you quite couldn't wouldn't quite expect to see a bartender be doing behind a bar, you know, with a, a Phillips head screw, a flathead screwdriver and, you know, chipping it away at some crusty gunk in a glass ready to put it back or serve to a customer. You know, so um, I did that and did it a few times and sort of walked out and went, oh, you know, I could have done a little bit better than that and finished up getting the part. So, but that's the conundrum of, of, auditions is the you know it's funny sometimes the ones that you think you did the worst at um you get and the ones that you think you did really well at you don't get for some reason so it's a, it's a bit of a weird vex or hex or whatever you want to call it Interesting. yeah that's how i got it so uh did i'm just curious uh 
Did you use an Australian accent when talking to French Stewart in the scene, or did you use an American one? Oh, it was all American. Um, I talked to him the way I'm talking to you right now in between takes um, or uh, in between setups. Um, but, you know, during the scene, I mean, that's the whole reason why um, I got the part as well is because it's an American accent. Yeah, that's just like um, Daybreakers. Daybreakers is American accent. Beastmaster was American accent. Um, yeah. What was he like to work with? French Stewart. Yeah. Awesome. He was really nice. He was really, really nice. Um, I asked him this one question because, you know, he's um, third rock from the sun. And um, I asked him about the, the, uh, the canned laughter. Uh, and because it, it sort of, it always interested me because it always, because when you listen to it, you can definitely hear um, sort of they're repeating some of this laughter in this laugh track sometimes. And he said, yeah, they did, they did use it, but also they have um, audience people that laugh out loud so that when they watch the show, they can hear themselves and point themselves out. It's like, hey, hear that? That's me laughing. So they, they really laugh out loud quite a lot and, and boisterously, I guess, just to be able to do that. So um, it, was, it was interesting just to get, talk to him about that, just to get that perspective of shooting, I guess, in front of a live audience, but also too in a soundstage where there's no one there where they have to sort of put that type of stuff in. <clears throat> yeah, so that that was all really that was interesting. And um, saying palm tree because in Australia we go palm tree, so it's like palm. We're, we're P A R M, <laughs> where you guys say palm. Well, so you, you actually have the you can hear yeah. the L. And um, he sort of he, he helped me with that because in the part of the dialogue was you got to grease a few palms if you get my drift. You know, and then he squirts axle grease onto my hand and I, you know, I, I get a little angry at him. But yeah. A little yes. angry. You were. A, a little angry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny. That was a funny scene. Like, I wouldn't call that a little bit angry. You were really angry because you were knocking his block off, literally. <laughs> oh, he said, go, go, get your duck, I think. And he ducks down. And I clobber the guy that's behind him. And that's yeah, like, I, a huge fracas, fracas starts, like, you know, a huge bar fight. But, um, you know, the funny thing is at the end, you know, they had a two cameras set up when they were, when they were shooting that. And it was 35 mil back then, I think, because most of the time these days they're shooting digital. So it's all ones and zeros and a hard drive. Um, but you know, back in the good old days... You know, they were shooting on, on, on two 35 mil cameras and they just kept kept rolling it. It was incredible because there's so much money, you know, it's a foot and a half per second that's going through the gate. And it's just like, cha-ching, cha-ching, there's so much money. You know, it just is like, oh, just keep it rolling, just keep it rolling. And right at the very end, because um, French Stewart says, check, please, just a check. And... Um, he, he, the director got him to say it like I was like seven or eight times differently. You know, it's just, oh, I'll say it again. I'll do it again. You know, you just keep doing it. You know, so you just stand there and just say it differently, you know, differently, differently. And um, I guess eventually they, they got the, the, the take that they wanted. Yeah. So, and I, I remember watching that. And when you, when you've clobbered the guy behind him, even you look surprised. You were like, "Well, yeah, that I was directed that." It was like, "Yep, yeah, wrong guy." Whoops. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I got this this thing happening behind my head again. See that? Notice. Yeah. Uh, 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 get stuck in that. <laughs> oh, that's better. I love your sense of humor, man. But yeah, that was that was a really funny scene.